Uh, this is the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. Uh, today's interview is with John Austin McAllister and his wife, Mildred Salzman, which is S-A-L-T-S-M-A-N, McAllister, is present today, and the location of the interview is in their home at 19375 Barzell Point Road, Rogers, Arkansas, 72756. There's no camera operator today, and today is uh, Thursday, September 24, 2003. Okay, John. Okay, let's talk about um, your first days in the Navy. Um, were you drafted or did you enlist in the Navy? I enlisted. And you were in, you had your notes, did we mislay those on the unit? Down the time I was in? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was, uh, I went in the Navy the 18th of November, 1942, and left the 6th of May, 1946. Okay. And why did you choose to enlist in the Navy? Well, I was uh, almost certain I'd have been drafted, and uh, I wanted to. I thought I would rather serve in the Navy. Okay. Uh, and where were you living when you joined? I was Navy? living in Avoca, New York. Okay, and at home? I was living at home. Okay. Uh, what do you recall about your first days in the Navy? Well, I went to Buffalo on the uh, train. That's about 100 miles. And uh, found, I believe, the post office building in downtown Buffalo and was sworn into the Navy. And... Uh, uh, they put us up at a uh, hotel in downtown uh, Buffalo for a day or two, three, three days maybe, and uh, gave us uh, money or meal tickets, I'm not sure which, while we waited for a uh, group to gather and travel. Uh, okay. And where did you go from Buffalo? I went to uh, Naval air training station in Sampson, New York. Okay. And uh, what do you remember about your first day there? Well, we uh, came in uh, on, the, I believe we came on the train from Buffalo and uh, got to the station, went in the big building, took off their clothes, and put them in a box about 16 inch cube, I think, split something like that. Addressed the box to our parents or whatever, and uh, kept only our wallet and razor, little things like that, in a small cloth bag they gave us. And then we went and took a shower and went to a doctor for an examination, and uh, then they measured us for our new clothing and wrote uh, sizes on our chest with a grease pencil and then we walked in a row in front of the counter holding a mattress cover and uh, the uh, people behind the counter tossed the clothes in the mattress cover and, and we got our first complete sailor's outfit that way. The first outfit was given to us after that, we uh, purchased clothes we needed. Them. We had a clothing wall. So what what made up your uniform, your complete kit uniform? Well, there was two mattress covers, two nice wool blankets, a pillow, a uh, hammock, and the ropes that went with it. There was uh, a set of dress blues with a white uh, striping around the collar and cuffs. I believe there was uh, one one pair maybe of undressed blues which were warm, 
sailor type clothes with uh, without the white piping. There were two pair of dungarees, a dungaree jacket, and a pair of low shoes, and a pair of uh, over the ankle shoes, about six pairs of socks, underwear, towel, washcloth, a pocket knife, a uh, long bar of soap, unwrapped, that you could cut a lump off from. Uh, that was just about it. How about hats? Yes, we got the white hats and got maybe two or three of them and the blue wool cap, hat and a watch cap as a stocking cap, a dark blue stocking cap. And I, we got the uh, leggings that you could wear with your to keep your trousers from flopping around the mud, which you had to wear all the time you were in basic training. That's why they called it boot camp. Huh, okay. Um, it, in my mind, I have this picture of a young men going into the military and having all their hair cut off. Did you have to have yes, your hair cut Yes, we had our hair all, all cut. Uh, probably not as uh, severely as they might in Marines, but they were cut down probably half an inch. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea how many young men there were with you that day? No. Probably, probably a couple hundred gathered there all at once. I don't know. Did you know anyone? Didn't know anyone. Hmm. And so when you finished getting all your gear, then you were assigned uh, barracks? We were assigned to barracks, marched over, and I went in and uh, we were assigned a, a bunk. We had double bumps uh, one above the other. And I think there was about a hundred people in each large room. And if I, I'm not, I was trying to remember and I couldn't. I think it was a downstairs and upstairs. I'm not sure if there was two rooms, or two big rooms or one. But it was quite a, quite a large wooden frame building. And there were rows of them. And there was, uh, Quite a bit of open space we could march around, but the plant was about the uh, uh, place was being built. Mm, okay. It was being built at the same time as being used. Did they give you any kind of a box to put your personal possessions in, or where did you store your things? We had a locker about uh, about like the high school lockers, half height, okay. probably about. 30 inches tall and if you foot wide and 16, 18 inches deep. Everything would fit in the locker uh, if it was packed properly. And uh, except the hammock, we pulled it up and put on the springs under the mattress. Ah, and okay. we folded it lengthwise to make it fit. And uh, we'd be, uh, we had the locker, and I don't remember that we locked them. Hmm. I'm not sure. I don't remember. Locked. How did you label your clothes, since they would have all gone to a laundry, I guess? Well, we didn't go to the laundry. We washed it by hand and uh, dried it. They had, a <clears throat> they had a laundry room with a long wooden tables and water spigots and a two tin buckets, and you took the bucket and a piece of your soap, and I think we may have had a small scrub brush in our supply of personal items, and scrubbed them, and rinsed them, and up in the attic of this uh, place there was clotheslines, and we had a bunch of little pieces like shoestrings, with little metal ends, mm -hmm. we call them clothes tops, we used them to tie the clothes to the line. I and uh, to keep uh, track of the clothes, they were all stenciled. They caught a uh, stencil with your name. You took white paint or black paint, whichever was appropriate, a brush and stenciled it inside of your clothes with your name. And uh, they were very, very strict about anybody that stole anything. Was it would be pretty much bad times for them. Hmm. 
Do you remember your first night sleeping in that huge room with all of those people? Not particularly. Okay, so it didn't... didn't uh, apparently it didn't bother me that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I knew you had a small family and uh, just wondered... No, it didn't. Uh, well, it didn't. I don't remember any uh, qualms about uh, sleeping in a one in a big room or like that. Or it didn't. Uh, it didn't disturb me. There was no problem. Okay. No problem. Uh, what do you remember about your instructors or your or the uh, officers in charge of your group? I don't remember much. The um, people that. Uh, were in, in the, uh, our leader, Mike Call, was a chief petty officer and he was a athletic, chief athletic instructor, they called him. And uh, that was a new, I think, was a new uh, classification for people who had, had a background as a high school coach or uh, high school teacher of some kind, uh, something like this was brought in and they didn't use for instructing the hordes of people they expected to train in a short period of time. So we marched a lot. We went uh, and had a swimming test at an indoor pool. We went and uh, shot a 22 rifle on a small firing range. We, uh, I uh, must have learned something, I'm not sure why. <laughs> and did they give you any kind of aptitude test? I don't remember any. Okay. They might have, but I don't remember. Okay. Uh, how long were you in, in uh, boot camp? I was there eight weeks. The camp was supposed to last 12 weeks, but they wanted the people out. And after about six weeks, they started thinning out the ranks, there'd be a list on the bulletin board, and, and away you went. And uh, after eight weeks, uh, my name popped up one morning, and I was gone. I went uh, home for uh, a few days. I, actually, I got delayed orders. I got orders to travel to Richmond, Virginia, to a school there, and uh, I had uh, something like six or seven days to get there. And uh, the Samson and my home weren't too far apart, maybe 50 or 60, 80 miles, I don't know. But she couldn't get there very well because the railroad ran the wrong way across the state. There wasn't any connection. I went to the, they went to get me her tickets and that, and they said, well, there's no feasible way, so they gave me a two cents a mile or something like that. Well, we shelled off, and I think I took the bus part of the way, hitchhiked part of the way, got home. When I got home, it was railroad. I went down to Richmond, Virginia, and grew up. So, uh, was there a pass for you for for men in the service to just get on the train, and or did you no, have to buy a ticket? Had to buy a ticket. Okay. And so, from there, you went to Richmond. Yeah. And then were you assigned? I mean, by that time, did you know what you were going to be doing? Oh, I went to Richmond to a diesel school, but I think primarily for the uh, amphibious forces. They had a world of small boats. Even their ships were diesel powered, and they were training the world with people for, for that. And uh, so I went to to the uh, eight-week uh, beginning course in, uh, at the diesel school and finished that. And I uh, was promoted to fireman first class, which sounds kind of old-timey, but that's what engine crew or engine room people were first for firemen and then the petty officer. Seaman was promoted to first class seaman. There was work in the engine room. And I went to first class part. And then I went to five more weeks of diesel school and promoted to motor machines to make second class, second class petty officer. And then I stayed in the diesel school there as an instructor for a few weeks. And 
flat there in the summer of that year. Okay. And I went to uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, what they uh, had a, an old Ford plant, was what they called it. The Navy base had taken over a Ford assembly plant. It's a great big long building. The railroad tracks in it. And a pier on the it was on a street on the one end, and the pier on, stuck out on the other end of the James River. And we had a great big supply of landing craft of all kinds around there that they were painting and repairing. They were rebuilding engines all day and all the time. So that's where I came. I came in there alone. The North Virginia got off train station. Nobody in the world had heard of that place. I had orders to go there. You're supposed to get there. And uh, I finally found the Red Cross or something downtown Norfolk. And there was somebody there. Some some reason they found another sailor that was uh, going back there. So I went along with him and found where I was supposed to go. And the way on the outskirts, you rode out on the streetcar. I was going to go to to get there. And so I was in the old Ford plant, but barracks there was just one great big room, just one great big warehouse with bumps in it. And the ceiling was so high you couldn't hardly see it. It was, uh, it was just a great big storeroom that they put bumps in, and that was where we stayed. They, uh, they had a pretty good kitchen set up and pretty good food. Mm -hmm. I was there all oh, about three, three, four months. And uh, worked uh, testing engines. We took uh, rebuilt engines and uh, had a regular arrangement to stand us, uh, set them up and operate them for a few hours, three or four hours. And uh, if they were okay, they were put aside to use them boat again. If not, they had to be fixed, whatever. So I worked at that. and. Uh, one day my list name came up on a list, and uh, I went to uh, Long Island, New York, and uh, we waited there a little while, and uh, then uh, we went overseas. Now, what year would that have been? What? What year was that? That would have been in uh, '43. Okay. And it was in the fall that I went overseas. It was in, I think, in November. So I'm pretty sure we had Thanksgiving dinner on the ship. Mm -hmm. so we went, uh, we went out to this, uh, like a holding tank on North Lido Beach, Lido Beach, Long Island. And then, uh, they took us in a back of a covered truck down, rain, I guess, that day, down to the pier. Got on a ferry, went someplace else, got off, and eventually we came to the Queen Elizabeth, the first one, mm -hmm. marched up the gangplank and on down inside. And it had been uh, built as a luxury liner, converted to a troop carrier. Never used as a liner, but as the first part. And uh, it was had been crowded. We uh, didn't have any four holes, so we stayed there and there. We were five days crossing the Atlantic. One time I got to uh, see the outside because I got the uh, privilege of carrying a trash can from our department up and dumping <laughs> it over the stern. And everybody went up with their trash can and approximately the same time. They pitched them all over at about the same time. so. A submarine following along wouldn't have a continuous trail of trash. Of trash, you know, they um. just be lots of trash here and there. That's what they told us anyhow. And it was a great, dismal day. We kept on going. We went the northern route from New York to uh, Greenwich, Scotland. You know, probably about four days. They, it was a fast ship, and they weren't weren't wasting time. Did you have any problems with seasickness or anything? No. Good. The ship was very 
Very stable. Very stable. No problem. But that, uh, virtually that whole time you were inside the ship, you weren't yes, a lot off. Well, I mean, it, you know, they had so many people on it, what, what are you going to do? Exactly. We exactly. went, uh, they had the first meal from 6 in the morning till noon, and the second meal from 1 until 6 or 7. Good heavens. And if you ate late in the morning, you ate late in the afternoon. Do you have any idea how many men were on that ship? No, I don't. I wouldn't hazard to guess. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't hazard to guess. And you, you slept in your, I take it, you slept in your hammock? No, we didn't. We, I never slept in the hammock all the time. I carried the darn thing around. We, <laughs> slept in it. we uh, at that time, the Navy pulled a hammock up between a couple of hooks and uh, put the mattress in it and the blankets and the pillow. And then they wrapped a hammock around it, around it, and canvas. And then you took a rope and, and, and made a lashing the whole length of it, so it's like a long sausage. And then the rest of your stuff was in a sea bag about that tall, about that big around the white okay. canvas bag. Okay. And you brought the hammock around it and tied it together. And you're supposed to carry that on your back when you were between stations or something like that, uh, which you could do, but it wasn't easy. Oh, I wouldn't think so. To get into a small boat or something like that, it was great, but to walk along with that was practical. Well, it wasn't really practical. That's the way they did it. It was doable, huh? Doable. Yeah. <laughs> I think about the last, last year I was in the Navy, they just gave up on having so many used them in years. They kept them, and uh, I felt rather badly about it because it was a nice piece of canvas, and it was actually given to me. It wasn't uh, but they kept the darn, uh, they kept the uh, hammocks, the mattress. Hmm. You didn't have to carry all that stuff with you anymore. Hmm. But I, I felt a little badly about losing my losing your hammock. Yeah, after losing all it. it was, it was <laughs> gone anyhow. So you went, you went, the Queen Elizabeth sailed to Scotland. Yeah. And then, did you get off there, or we got off the ship in Scotland, the ground of Scotland, got on a railway train. Of course, it was in November. I have no idea what time it was, but it wasn't daylight. You probably know daylight up there, right? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> yeah. we, we were old. Of course, you've got to realize it's old. Everything was old. We opened the window on the train, looked out, and here's an old group of walking down the track, beside the track. What time is it? About a quarter past. <laughs> that wasn't much help, I tell you. <laughs> but anyhow, we train rattled on all night. We came down to Team with England and uh, built our own uh, Navy base there. The Seabees, it's a construction branch the Navy had been in and lined up uh, several little old hotels. It's a beach town. A little old one room white hotel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was two, so we had enough of them to house everybody, several people in the room. They had bunks in there, or they had double bunks in there. Our mess hall was the original dining pavilion or something on the waterfront, a little kind of a restaurant. Mm -hmm. In fact, they took that over for our dining. And we had to, another old hotel, was a little, a little bit more stylish, was a, where the uh, office was. And down on the docks, we uh, had a machine shop. And, uh, carpenter shop and whatever we used to maintain some boats. And after we got that pretty well organized by the boats came in with boat crews, they didn't live on the boats. They were a 50 foot long LCMs. They carried 25 tons. They carried a tank or truck or some man or whatever. Now, now what does LCM stand for? Landing craft mechanized. And by that time, do you remember what unit you were in? The only uh, thing I had that identified it was in Duha 29, D U H A 29. Hmm. And uh, but, uh, I've spoken to veterans and uh, went with their outfit. They went together. They, they fought a war together. I went along like a lone. Gunman out west or something, I guess. I, they sent me here and they sent me there. And we gathered up and I, we were with uh, 
for that uh, group of people for I went over there in November and I came back uh, in uh, June, I think. Not the next year, it was the year after. Hmm. I came back, yeah, I went, I went over there in November, the invasion was in 44, and I came back in 45. And we stayed with quite a few of those people, or what stayed with us all that time. The boat crews came and what? We never. I knew a lot of people, but not. There wasn't, there wasn't sort of any shared. They were like customers or something. They came in, got the boat fixed, traveled down, worked on the boat or something like that. We visited, and, but we didn't have a, we didn't have a group or even. Mm -hmm. We had a commanding officer. I never, I couldn't remember the name of it. Okay. So did you did you make any close friends? Were you able to make any close friends during that time? Why? Well, yes, we had. I, we were quite quite friendly, quite close at the time. But then, uh, then uh, your name would come up on the boat and board or something. You'd leave and you'd be, you'd be gone. But I never rode or yeah, never yeah. rode or. You know, we were going. I can remember Carpenter's mate from Arkansas. And his name was Leonard Elwin Mobs. Elwin Mobs. And he was older. And uh, he was from down in Delta someplace. And he worked for Carpenter, I guess, in Arkansas. So he was a work on the boat repair at Carpenter. I knew it. I can say a bunch of a group of people, but not a not a close uh, friendly. Not not like you see in the movies where these no, people are like in a, a unit that are together from start to finish. That's that's correct. They went, huh. through, they went through basic training and and eventually they probably be uh, mustered out together. Right. I think the army did that, but the navy uh, did not that I'm aware of. Possibly on some of the ships, they uh, put a crew together, to, uh, and the ship would be delivered to maybe take it over. But even then, I imagine the crew would be a mixture of uh, experienced people, probably uh, about uh, maybe 30 percent experienced people would come into that ship, and maybe uh, the rest of them might be drawn from some other place. Huh? At the, at the top of each ship. Well, that's interesting. I I never, uh, I guess I've never thought about it. Um, so, when you were in England, um, did you have liberty so you could go to London or go to any of the, the major cities near where you were located? Yes, I went to London once. We didn't travel much. Travel wasn't uh, extraordinarily easy. It was black out at night. You could hardly get around. There were no taxis or anything like that. And uh, you could take the train. But uh, there was no maps or I mean, it just, just didn't travel much. We were fairly busy. On the other hand, we weren't confined very closely. We got up in the morning and ate and uh, got dressed and walked over to the mess hall and ate our breakfast, walked back to our room. And Maybe wait a minute or two and then walk over to where we worked. I think then we, the uh, chief or the, whoever was in charge of the place would come down and get everybody out and check them on the muster list. I think that was the only check they had on us during for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. As we didn't march in the unit down and eat and march back right. or anything like that, we right. wandered down the street. Then we. Uh, at night we could wander around. And of course, it was totally dark. No light coming out of the windows or anything. We walk along and listen. You might hear uh, voices or a snatch of song or a piano take them away and try a door and find a pub. Because um, uh, there's lots of pubs there. Sure. But uh, it was a pretty quiet life, really. And we worked. Uh, I think every, I think maybe in Tima we had Sundays off, 
Uh, we left Demuth and took our boats and went to Weymouth, did the same thing on a bigger scale. And uh, there we worked for a long time. We worked uh, 10 or 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. Worked all the time. Then you got to wash your own clothes. You got to keep your room tidy up a little bit and uh, go and get your meals and everything else. So we just didn't do it a whole lot. We didn't. Uh, we had uh, some entertainment. Once or twice we had some people come in. I don't particularly remember going down in that hall. Once or twice I uh, got some people that could uh, perform a little bit and had a show that sailors put on. Okay. Some, some of the officers had taken the time and had done that, which we enjoyed that a lot. But um, I don't remember any movies. Huh. I don't remember any movies. I know that uh, later the military used to have projectors and get films. Right. But I don't remember that at all. When I was hmm. Well, it sounds to me like you all were basically uh, almost working like you were in a regular job. You were just working well, as hard as you could work true. all day long, but it was basically just like a job. Yeah, I probably the, this would be about right. Was there any uh, particular security in the area where you worked? Did you have to show identification or? Um, uh, I think we had a guard down the gate on the road where it came into our area, maybe. But uh, you no, know, you walk in and out on the beach, you can go in and out. You can take a small boat and run up the river and tie it up. Uh -huh. Nobody ever, nobody seemed to care. I mean, it, uh, how interesting. It would be like Devil's Island, there really wasn't any place to go, so they didn't have to keep the sailors in, and I guess nobody, had, nobody, had, no, there wasn't a lot of security. Nobody, they, they weren't too concerned about somebody trying to get in. I don't remember that they were at all. When uh, was, I don't remember, was uh, Britain still being bombed when you went there in 43? Yeah. Um, did you have any experience with that? We went to London once and uh, some of the buzz bombs came in, one or two I heard then. And uh, just before the invasion in June of 1944, the uh, Weymouth had the harbor full of ships uh, ready to go to Normandy, and uh, the Germans sent over one plane, and it flew over, and I think the first night it came over, every, they had all these, all kinds of world of these small landing ships, 100 feet, 115, 130 foot ships like, you know, LCI, I was like that. Most of them had uh, anti-aircraft runs of some type, man, they all started shooting. And they lit the whole sky up, and the thing they did was the shells would go up, you know, they come down, and they, they uh, I was down on the pier, and the shells come right up the pier, bang, 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 oh, bang, landing on the pier. They didn't hurt anything. And uh, the next night, the same thing happened, but they never fired a shot. They apparently had Somebody told him, just don't shoot at the guy. He'd fly, come in and fly over, and uh, I think one time he dropped one bomb off in the countryside someplace. Uh -huh. just, uh, of course, Germany was essentially on their knees at that time. They anyway. pretty they didn't, they couldn't, uh, didn't have much to come, come with, so just one time that they, just one time that they had one bomber come over. Hmm. All by himself? All by himself. Okay. When you say the shells fell, are you talking about the shell casings? No, the projectiles, the explosive projectiles. So they would they would go up and explode, and then part of them would fall back down. Well, they, well, they shoot they shoot up the bullet, and it flies up the bullets and the bullets as a uh, has got uh, explosive in, so whatever it hits it will destroy. You see, right? So the bullet was up, doesn't hit anything when it falls down oh. the ground and explodes. Thunder! It hadn't exploded then. That, that, that part of it hadn't exploded, no. So when it hit the pier, I take it it yeah, exploded? It, it was, oh, shit. <laughs> that, that would get your attention in a hurry. <laughs> was, well, like I said, it didn't, it didn't 
do any damage, but it was surprising. Huh, I imagine it was. So when the ships started to gather, obviously everyone knew something was up. Oh, yeah. And everyone knew that that something was an invasion of some yeah. kind. Did you all spend much time speculating as to where and when? No, not really. Like I said, we were busy right up until the moment they left. Another interesting thing was that the last day or two, they uh, somebody decided that they kind of hide this operation, if you can imagine it. Wayman Harbor being, Portland Wayman Harbor being hit, and they set off fog generators. And they sent this fog out, and it just laid there, you know, so they used steam and oil or something to make permanent fog, I guess. Yeah. The small boats trying to run back and forth from the ship, back and forth down and everything like that, just couldn't get anywhere. Oh, what a mess. You what know, you couldn't mess. see any, you couldn't see 50 feet through that stuff. It was just all over the harbor. So they would have the time of that. Of course, it's awfully hard to navigate a small boat by compass in a crowded harbor or something like that. But they had that thing just full of fog. But they left and went to Normandy and where they are. Hmm. I didn't go to Normandy, but where they are, there wasn't a ship or a boat or a thing to fix in there, tied up to our dock or anywhere around. Did they, uh, did they, did the boats from where you were leave early in the morning? Do you remember? I don't remember. It was quite a run over there. It was, uh, Probably 24 hours running. Oh, I didn't realize it would take that long to make that. Well, I had to. They were quite a, it was quite a long run, and I believe they were held up too somewhere in the weather. Yeah, the weather, I, I remember the weather, the weather was, was bad. bad for a couple, you know, just prior to, to that. I talked to some of the guys that went on the 50-foot LCM. They, they had a, a rough ride to the full floor. So the troops, the troops land uh, loaded there in Weymouth Harbor. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, did they just get on the night before, or were they on the night before? No, they were pretty well, on, pretty well on the night, night before, and uh, they were on for a day or two. Maybe they just was loading went on, ships filled up. The uh, harbor filled up. I think ships come in from other places too. There was a lot. Uh, we had fifty small boats, and then. Uh, there was a flotilla or something, LCIL, there, 160 feet long and carried several hundred infantrymen. Now, were these open boats? No, these were uh, LCIL across the Atlantic under some power. Oh, okay. okay. Did yeah. it have a multiple deck or what? Oh, yeah, they were. They were they big. Were, they were, I don't have a picture of them. They're pretty, pretty neat little ships. They were flat mm -hmm. bottom. They didn't have a bow or anything. Okay. They had a pointed bow. And they had a ladder on each side that went down on the beach. They could drive them right up on the beach and lower the ladder and keep them walk off. Oh, for heaven's sake. How well do you, do you, do you know how well they did at the landing? Pretty good, I guess. Pretty okay. good. One of them came back. I knew the crew line slightly. I, uh, put new engines in it before they left. It was the first one we had to come in the Coast Guard ship, the actual Coast Guard crew. And we uh, set up a deal to exchange the engines. We took the eight, inch, eight truck engines that drove, and uh, drove them through gears. And we took the engines out and replaced them. We uh, rebuilt the engines. We took the old engines, went to Weymouth, and we had a shop where the uh, U.S. personnel pre manufacturing. And I worked on the, I think the first one we did. 94 LCIL 94, and uh, they came back. Uh, but uh, they lost their wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. And uh, while well, superstructure of it they remained back up, with was pretty well all shot up. Of course, it was lightweight metal anyhow anymore. It wasn't armored by any Right. And, uh, I don't know, they got on the beach, and they, there was a gun on the beach that was uh, all set for that, you know. 
while they were unloading and shot the, shot the upper part of the ship all up. And they had an emergency steering wheel down in the last red. That's why I was going to ask if it shot up the wheelhouse, how in the world did they get yeah. it home? The wheelhouse didn't even have a wheel in it. Those ships weren't built for uh, style, they were built for gold. It just had a lever that huh. operated an electric motor that turned the wheel down the last red. So now, what's the last red? The last little storage space way in the stern of the ship. Okay. Way long in the stern. Okay. And there's a hatch back there, and I know the ships was down there. And they had a guy down there steering and getting a direction from somebody above. The engine room, the overhead in the engine room was a deck that you walked on, just behind the uh, mess hall. And they had a guy sat there with a hammer and beat on the deck for the stop and start the engines and maneuver then. Wow. So, do you happen to recall how long it was from, yeah. or when they started coming back? Yeah, they came back in, in about. Uh, Probably 48 hours. Um, did did a good did most of the ships come back? Yeah. Well, I did. I uh, I changed the propeller on one LCIL. It was a little uh, uh, shipyard across the river from us. It was owned by the British, and they could pull it up there on. Green Railway, so we got up out of water, and I went over and uh, they, I had two or three English sailors, and we, uh, I'd never done that before. I'd never, uh, when we went to Jesus School, we had a complete, box, a complete setup of the engines and the propeller shaft and the propeller. It was a variable pitch propeller. Backed up by twisting the blades of the guitar to a different angle. Mm -hmm. So when you took it apart, it was kind of a complex mechanism to get it apart under there. And of course, it was probably 42 inches diameter or better. Mm -hmm. size, yeah, that's good. Size four bladed bronze. Mm -hmm. and there was a place to put a hoist in the bottom of the ship and uh, have all in the propeller. To work that out. I think the one of the weirdest things about doing that job was the dark, of course, just dark so inside of a dog, and we worked with <laughs> one, one electric torch, you know, and the ship had no lights, and everybody on that ship was asleep. Everybody was asleep. How bizarre. The engines were shut down, the generating engine was shut down, and no lights on it. And you'd have to go and fumble your way down in the engine room and, and uh, operate the controls to move the pitch rod to move the propeller back so you get ah. the control that thing, you know. And the British guys had never seen one. They didn't even want to work on it because it, they, they, it wasn't their job, I guess, that they were supposed to do other sailing things besides that. We muffled along and got it done and we put the ship back, back in the water. And I was thinking about that. I don't. I never saw it tested or, you know, there wasn't back, it went back more than that. I know it was still not underwater, so. Anyhow, it was gone. But that was, so much of me who was running about that way. Um, just go and do it, come back, you know. Hope for the best. Well, no, don't worry about it, you just play. It usually worked out pretty well, too. Hmm. I think that was where the United States had a wonderful advantage. Because so many of the people that I knew, particularly in the Navy, when I was attracted, we just uh, didn't worry about these details. Why well, didn't, didn't uh, they didn't have to have a certification to do that? You, you could uh, do that job. A more prag pragmatic, pragmatic approach. Pragmatic, uh, particularly people from a farming background. Hmm. They just they don't. Uh, uh, it was just none of this was not my job, or I wasn't trained for it, or uh, somebody else ought to I don't have it. a book or something yeah. like that. You know, it, it was like you got to fix it, well, it will get it fixed. Yeah, right. yeah that so-called can-do attitude. But, uh, yeah, it was different then. Yeah. Well, John, I don't know how we're fixed on tape, 
Let me check. It's oh, right. good for, I think, two hours. Oh, is it? Oh, good. Then let's just keep going. If you're not tired, I'm not tired. No, this soon going to run down to this. Okay, well, what, um, uh, do you remember what your rank was? More than she's made first class. So you stayed that rank yes. through the whole time? Okay. Well, then after, after Normandy, how long were you in Britain? Let's see, 44, about a year. Okay. We uh, repaired, reconditioned the world of the old uh, landing craft that were in Normandy, used in Normandy, in San Juan, the United States. They had the hopes of, uh, I don't know, hopes, but they were planning an invasion of Japan at that time. Mm -hmm. So that stuff was all picked up and what was usable. It was overhauled in San Juan. We worked on it. Uh, world equipment, then we uh, dismantled our base, shipped it away piece by piece, created up the, all the things that we had there, and uh, they went out on a train, I guess, I don't remember really the details. The interesting thing was that uh, at the very last end, we had to clean out the hotels where we stayed, uh, stop our mess hall, and all that, you know, and it just like it was. When you got there, we got there, or better. Or better. And they brought in a temporary housing for us in the form of a salt land. And that was a USS salt land. It was an old steamship built in Philadelphia, I think, in 1906 or something like that. It ran, Good ran night. someplace up and down Chesapeake. And it had a gingerbread and it had regular old sash windows and a wheelhouse and the great big wheel and cables that ran down the length of the ship to the rudder. Well, and a big old reciprocating steam engine right in the middle of it that drove with the propeller and hand fired coal burning boilers. And they. How did they ever get that thing over there? They sailed the sucker over. <laughs> <laughs> they oh, sailed it across the Atlantic. And they used it in the invasion of Africa for uh, the story we got was, which is, there was all these kind of stories which you don't, but you can call their interest. Was it was going to be a diversion fleet and put a skeleton crew on it and a bunch of Germans come out of Africa and shot it all up. You see, they, they got the wrong thing. Oh, for but more. That didn't work, so it was still floating, so they used it for, a, which is more probably what they used it for was a a mothership for all these small landing craft. Okay. And after the crew would run, run out of an open boat for 24, 36 hours, they need to take a rest or something like sure. that. Sure. So they could go on here, you know, and get a hot meal and sleep or whatever. The thing was, uh, the car deck on it was, uh, full of double deck or triple deck bumps, you know. They had a, uh, old portable water distilling machine in there with a smokestack running out of one of the windows. <laughs> It, it was a, wow. it was a real, it was a real fright, and you know, <laughs> they sailed them back to the United States. Or if, and, and and do you know what happened? Do you know what um, what happened to it? Did I don't know. I, uh, well, they, they probably just jumped it when they got over to the United States, because that was when the Japan got the atomic bomb and surrendered, and that there was no more need for them. Why they ever? Why in the world they ever? Took that there, I can uh, back to the United States, but I stayed on it for a few nights, not long. We moved out of our room up where we stayed for about a year there, and then moved into the South and then we moved down to uh, Plymouth, England, and stayed there for a little bit, and uh, we were supposed to get the next ship back. We did, and it was LST. Landing ship with a PT boat chained down on top of it, and it took us uh, 15 days in the summertime to cross the Atlantic, mm -hmm. operating at full speed ahead. That was a little different than crossing on Queen Elizabeth, I would imagine. Yeah, really now, now those LSTs, I have pictures of World War II movies of these things that are just big open boats. That's yeah. not what this was. Yeah, this was really you, you mean you were just out in the in the open that 15 No, no, it's, it's an enclosed ship. But 
The valve, uh, the valve height opens up with two big doors, and then there's a big ramp, it's water tight that drops down. Ah. Uh, mechanically, then the stuff dries out, and there's uh, two layers of tanks or trucks or whatever back in that big hole, and elevator to run them up and down. Oh, that and is a big thing. Then there's a uh, something you wouldn't have thought of, it was a complete operating room in there for surgery. Oh, heaven's sake. So they have a field hospital there, so when they go in and unload these guys, if there's anybody over there that needs some repairs, they just scoop them up and take them in there and fix them up um, on their way back to get another load of people. Well, that's kind of a, I mean, that's an efficient use of the space, and it's a good idea well, I mean, that you've never made. The operating made. room was always there for them. Huh. We so there. how many, when you made the crossing, do you have any idea how many men were on that ship? Probably 200 or 300 in the passenger uh, space, and uh, so I was a passenger on that one. And uh, I think the crew on there was about 75 or 80. Wow. And, but, uh, they had down the sides of it, on the, right at the top, the top of the, of the hull, but down the sides, it was under the deck, under the main deck. It was like a hall oh, about the size and shape of the back of a tractor trailer. It had double bunk or triple bunks on each side, just a walkway down through the middle mm-hmm. of the ship. And towards the stern, they had some, had some bathrooms, and then the, the uh, galley, the cooking facility, was on the, was on the deck level. Extended right across the ship, you wanted one side, the child went right across the ship. Yeah, the other, other side. You just went in with a mess kit and you got your food and went set down where you could eat. But the crew had a dining room where they were. Okay. Okay. What did you do on that 15 days for entertainment or pass the All time? All the red books that were passed around and uh, I think they had a, they may have had a movie or two. And uh, I think there was, there were two officers out there. The chaplain was one of them, the doctor was another. And they both came and got people who wanted to listen to them together and got a blackboard and talked a little bit. It was beautiful weather. Hmm. And, uh, but now the war with Japan was not over yet, was it? No, it wasn't. What did you expect was going to happen, as far as you were concerned, once you got back to the States? Well, I would have sort of expected to have gone over to the Pacific uh, for the uh, war in Japan, but uh, I got to the States, and uh, I think I came on leave. I went to Paul and Norfolk, and I went up on leave. I think I got... Well, a pretty good two weeks or 30 days, something to leave like that. And during that time, uh, Japan surrendered. Okay. So when I went back, the war with Japan was over. And uh, so I went, and uh, the last assignment I had, I was engineer on Admiral's barge. Hmm. Admiral Briscoe. That's one of the very few names I ever can remember. I don't know what he did. I was a land user with the amphibious. I stayed out in the USS. Well, I went up to Portland, Maine, and uh, they had, uh, he was up there. We ran the barge around between the islands and the harbor up there in Carriage Yard. Some mm-hmm. captains around there and there. And then they moved, uh, moved us down to uh, Norfolk to get on the uh, USS had a run back. Okay. It was a converted Liberty ship. Just a freighter converted from the for offices for a command ship. AGC 15. And uh, we put the Admiral's put the Admiral's barge on the Wyoming to carry it down. And I went down with it on Wyoming as a passenger on hmm. the battleship Wyoming. And that was uh, the oldest battleship they had in the Second World War. It had uh, fired the most ammunition of any ship in the Second World War, they told us. And it had never missed a Friday night in Norfolk. So I went up to 
Casco Bay or whatever. It's always been back by Friday night. By Friday night. By Friday night. I have to say. What it was was uh, they'd taken a, a great big 15-inch uh, rifle with big guns that had been taken off, and it had uh, had our aircraft guns at it, and it was uh, used for, for gunnery practice. Hmm. They steamed out Monday morning and fired to all these anti-aircraft guns like that for the week, and then they steamed back in Friday night. So it was really a training vessel more than anything else. Okay. And it was big and it was heavy, hmm. the size of a battleship or up to 24 inches of solid steel at the water line, so torpedoes don't necessarily hurt them. Okay. Well, that was the idea. Huh. And the decks, you know, are tremendously big. I, they, they're very, very heavy. Of course, this one was not very speedy. I imagine it took quite a lot of kids. It was oil burning steamship. It took a lot of people, a lot of people to operate it. It was quite comfortable. And quite a nice ride from Portland, Maine down to Northern Virginia. So, by that time, the war was essentially over. Um, were you anxious to get out of the Navy, or were you fairly content just to uh, go on until it was time to make a you know, until someone said, okay, you need to make a decision, or do you recall? I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, I was sort of neutral. Okay. My uh, position was pretty good for an enlisted man. And uh, the I had around that. I, uh, I found the thing uh, a little uh, disorganized. <laughs> I don't know what you could say about it. I I, I didn't uh, didn't care so much for the uh, living on the Adirondack. And I, uh, they went into a point system, you could, your time overseas, you know, your age and something. And so all of a sudden that changed and uh, I could leave. And I thought that one over, I think it was in January. And uh, just about the right holiday time. Of course, New York State's cold and snowy and I didn't have a job. And I just went down there. To Okay, so that would be May. May of 46? 46, yeah. Okay. Well, it sounds like you got really good training and good education so far as what you were doing in the Navy. Uh, did you believe that that prepared you to get a good job when you got out? Why? Yes. Yeah, I came out and uh, went to, I worked for a farm machinery place for a while in Canada. And then I worked for the you know, village bath in their diesel power plant for three or four years. And then I took advantage of the GI Bell when school uh, Agricultural Technical School in New York, took diesel technology course for two years. And then I worked for one of the major engine builders at the time, Smith Sis Hollands. More than a corporation in Buffalo, New York, I worked there for, I guess, about 10 years. And you and Mildred were married in 19. 47. 47, okay. And uh, then after you were with, with uh, is it Worthen, W-R-T-H-E-N? W-O-R-T-H-I-N-G. I-N-G, sorry. Yeah, okay. Worthen. Okay. So when you, you were with them for 10 years, and then where did you go from there? Well, I went and sold some engines in the Florida Keys, Customers had some problems with them, and uh, I uh, they asked me if I'd like to go down and work for the customer. And I went down and I was superintendent of generation for the Florida 
he's electric. And that worked out long all right. Uh, wasn't a bad job. Very, very uh, sort of a. Well, you just work for yourself. You know? uh, but it was political. They uh, had the board elections, and they got into some law. Well, got into some hard feelings between the members of the board and the management. Fired the manager in the middle of the night, things like that. I stayed on, and uh, the Voice of America decided they wanted to build a big power plant in Greece. I didn't want to send them the engines, and uh, so I saw some engines. So the Oregon salesman came down with the Voice of America people in tow, and uh, they, I, I met them, and uh, they uh, made me a job offer. I, didn't care to refuse, and uh, so I went to work, possibly a little bit older, but not too bad. I went to work for the Voice of America's power plant supervisor. Now, what year was that? That was in 1960. I, I went there in 1966, first year. So now, you and Mildred packed up your five children? And yeah. went to Greece, and how long you were you were on roads, right? I was on roads five years. Okay. And uh, then I went over to the Philippines, and I was there about I think about six years. I'm not I'm not certain. And then from the Philippines, I came back to Liberia, West Africa, and I was there four years. Mm. And uh, then I went to Washington in 81, and I was there two years in Washington. Then I completed uh, 20, I had 20 years of service counting the military service, and I was over 50 years old, so I could retire, so they were... Uh, they changed managers in the Voice of America, and I didn't uh, really care to sit in Washington that much. And I did, so I came, retired, came here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you, over the years, taken part in any veterans groups or attended any veterans reunions? No, I belonged to the American Legion when I went back home. Uh, I was a charter member of the Legion in Boca. I'm still a member, but I didn't have continuous membership. And I have, I think, 23 years consecutive membership now, but it hasn't been back to 50 something. Two, okay. But I, I'm still a charter member. One of six is a member. Okay. And, uh, and I, oh, I guess we, I put on a uniform. And, March down to Memorial Day once or twice, maybe. And you still have your one of your uniforms? No, they're gone. I couldn't wear them. Yeah. I wouldn't say them there. They're gone. I don't have hardly anything. Mm -hmm. But if you had to, if, if, you know, looking back on it and, and thinking about your military experience, How do you feel about how that impacted your life overall? I don't know. I wouldn't have thought it would have been a, a tremendous change. Of course, you learn a lot. Mm -hmm. You have to learn all those things. You don't learn a lot. But I don't, I don't know that it uh, made a tremendous difference. Do you think going to Britain and and kind of making that 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 big jump out into the world made it easier for you, Mildred, to to later on take off and, and go to Greece and uh, spend a good deal of your lives in third world countries? 
Maybe so. I haven't. Uh, I was just thinking about, you know, a, a boy growing up and a girl growing up in a small town in upstate New York. Um, and the likelihood would be that your lives would have been spent in a Boca or surrounding area. Um, but um, obviously, you know, you didn't do that. And I just no, wondered I if... I didn't do that. If, uh, I may have been a little bit of... They have lacked a strong desire to stay in one place. I just assume go ahead and didn't make No, but I hadn't thought about it, Carol. I have often thought about what I could have done differently or done better. Or when you come to a, a decision, you, well, I could have stayed in the Navy. Mm -hmm. I could have stayed in the Navy for uh, 20 or 30 years. And uh, I don't know, I, I gave it a little bit of consideration, but not just a whole lot. Uh, I got them promoted to chief of the United States. I was saying to Peter. Mm, okay. Well, it's interesting how our lives uh, but, uh, work themselves out. Well, now you and Mildred were you and Mildred were married in '47. Yeah, we weren't married in this We married at about. Well, I was looking at dates here. We I got out May 16th, and we were married August 2nd. So it's about a year, four or five months, or something like that after I came out of the Navy. Well, when you all when you were gone, I'm sure you wrote back and forth. Uh, did you try to write each other daily, or did you just try to write each other uh, regularly? Or I'd say regularly, but not not daily. Uh, Another was remarked about that. She said we use just a mail as it was, but she got something like email off as uh, V mail. V mail, okay. You no, know, we use V mail. They uh, wrote a letter and they photographed it and sent the film and they printed the letter on the United States and you know, huh. all in the paper back and forth because airplanes weren't all that tra well, transportation was difficult. Oh, sure. What an in I had no idea that's how they did that. Yeah, the, the paper came a little old. It looked like those real early photo copies. Huh. And then they also had uh, little flimsies you wrote on, too, you know, little real flimsy paper and you pulled them up and they just over there. Oh, like arrow, like the arrowgrams? Yeah. Blue arrowgrams? Okay. Oh, I didn't think that. Was your mail censored? Yes. Okay. It was from England, of course. I don't think it was from the United States. Well, John, I think we've just about used up. They asked us to do this for about 90 minutes and you, you've done uh, done that. And uh, But before we close this, this interview, is there anything you thought about that we haven't talked about that you wanted to cover for the archive? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, I sometimes, when I see my grandchildren leave home go to college, and their mother and father go and build them furniture to fit their space and set their computer on it, buy them a cell phone to talk home, and I think about, well, they advanced me a train ticket to Buffalo, New York. That's all I'm down. We'll see you next year. <laughs> Maybe after that, another year, you know. <laughs> Go get him, son. Yeah, didn't say, didn't uh, there was no there was no common no uh no 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 which, uh, they didn't have a telephone. We never remember that I was talking about that the other day since this came up. We we talked on telephone a few times the last time I was in North Virginia on those on Adirondack, but uh, normally, you know, to just write a letter and uh, uh, tell you it was uh, come into town, hitchhiking, you know, somebody uh, come here at five in the morning with mm -hmm. Walked in and uh, there was a classmate of mine, a girl, on the railroad, around the gates at the railroad crossing, mm -hmm. sat sitting there in a little shanty and walked over and visited her until daylight. You did a lot of grow. You did a lot of growing up in those years, didn't you? Well, I was 
I said, oh, I didn't mind. I didn't, didn't yeah. see, see yeah. the thing any difference. Of course, I, I was extremely fortunate. I was never hurt. I was never sure. never really sick. Or they fixed my teeth up pretty good. You know, I was just fine. I learned something. We never never were hungry. Never. If they say something here about spies, as far as I know, we always had spies. Mm -hmm. To work with, and uh, as far as our food like that, we always, we always do. Yeah. And uh, I don't think we ever missed a meal. That's part of the part of the life of the Well, that's, uh, uh, I know my father said the same thing, so uh, I think that makes a big difference. Well, we appreciate you taking the time and the energy to do this, and uh, I'm just delighted that. That, that you wanted to, and we'll look forward to contributing this to the archives. Okay, thank you.